Let's bring our editorial microscope into focus on a very significant phenomenon, the middle income consumer. You may have met this character in Fortune's now famous series on the changing American market, which portrayed his dramatic rise into the dominant economic personality of our time. This 1953 study showed that the zoom in the American market after the war, the unprecedented volume of goods of all kinds gobbled up by an insatiable tide of buyers, was largely the work of this middle-income man. Let's update his story, its basic facts and figures to the present day. The biggest single fact in the story is this. Despite higher taxes, despite post-war inflation, the middle-income consumer has roughly 50% more spending power today than he had a generation ago. In real income, $240 billion. He has fed new demands into the production apparatus of industry, accounting for the housing boom, appliance sales, the rush for prepared foods, even the once exclusive preserve of the exclusive rich. The luxury market has been invaded in force and virtually captured by the middle income buyer. And this is only the seagoing phase of a campaign that has succeeded in changing the entire shape of the luxury market. How did it happen? Through a revolutionary change in the way U.S. income is distributed. In 1947, 27% of the population was in the middle income range, earning between $4,000 and $7,500 a year. In all, there were almost 13 million families in this bracket. By 1953, as Fortune told us, 5 million more families moved into this income category. Today, more than a million more families have promoted themselves to middle incomes. In terms of dollars, the families in this bracket now receive more than 42% of all income real income and their spending is just as real food is now a 64 and a half billion dollar market up eight percent since 1953 clothing sales up six percent from 1953 housing for the seventh straight year the industry has topped one million starts home goods furniture tv electrical appliances and such up 15 percent since 53 the family car, seven and a half million autos bought in 55. So far, demand has matched the incredible pace of American productivity, stride for stride. Let's look at the production story a moment. Over the past century, production per man hour showed an average increase of 2% per year. These two percentage points, compounded annually, doubled production over the last generation quadrupled it over the last two generations. They made America. But see what has happened since 1947. The yearly rate of increase has risen 50%, and the implications of that rise are truly staggering. If sustained, as it seems likely to be, it will remake America. Production per man hour is slated to redouble by 1980. But this productive potential if it is to translate itself into standard of living, has got to be sold, and in large measure, sold to him. Thus, marketing becomes the pivot on which our continued prosperity turns. Marketing must make the growing production mesh with the expanding market. This is where the challenge now lies. To meet that challenge, American business has taken a new look at its own attitude to marketing and advertising. Over the past 30 years, the ups and downs of advertising activity kept pace with the ups and downs of consumer spending. When sales rose, promotional activities rose. When sales dropped, advertising dropped. But in 1949, and again in 1953 and 54, there was a change. As the volume of sales slid down, advertisers countered by moving the volume of advertising steadily up. For the first time, advertising and selling were allowed to create sales, instead of sales creating advertising and selling. How come? That's the question we put to a group of manufacturers recently. Here are the answers. The vice president of a leading camera company said, 
In 1954, our advertising appropriation increased approximately 20% over 1953, whereas sales showed no change. As a result, we were able not only to hold our own in the marketplace, but to stabilize our employment levels. The president of a top oil company told us, our plans call for a continuation of our present aggressive advertising and promotional efforts. We fully expect our competitors to do likewise. The president of the number one beverage company said, businessmen today regard advertising as an investment rather than just a business expense. And the president of a leading tire and rubber company put it this way, advertising and other sales activities should not move up and down with minor changes in the total volume of business. They should maintain a steady pace geared to the overall growth trend. These statements represent a very real and important change in business thinking. The feeling is abroad that aggressive advertising and marketing, while they may not prevent short cyclical downturns in the economy, nevertheless will have a strong stabilizing effect over the long haul. This is exactly what happened when 1955 moved far ahead of the 1953-54 dip. The basic reasons for the new outlook are, first, a new confidence in the ability of government to help maintain economic stability. Businessmen now recognize that government is better equipped and better able to help check an inflationary or deflationary cycle. That government is constantly on the alert for any sudden rise or fall in the business barometer. Second, and far more important, is the growing awareness of business leaders that the number one job of industry today is distribution. Moving the goods into the hands of consumers matching desires with income, prices with costs, consumption with production. This is the function of marketing. And marketing, as management now realizes, consists of all company operations, except only physical production. All the services that help move the product to the buyer. Marketing research, product designing, product testing, product servicing, merchandising, packaging, pricing, physical handling, storage and transportation, credit and financing, accounting and billing, sales organization, sales force, sales outlets, retail selling, advertising, public relations. Where's the kitchen sink? Well, if you happen to manufacture kitchen sinks, there it is, right on top. The tangible product whose distribution depends on the successful interplay of all these 17 marketing functions. A manufacturer has a complete marketing plan only if he has covered every one of these vital operations. A third reason why businessmen have turned increasing attention to creative marketing is the changing American market expressed in the zooming birth rate with bigger families back in style the amazing mushroom growth of suburban America, the upgraded scale of income everywhere, and especially the new pattern of income distribution, which has let its bounty fall smack in the middle range of income. As these groups continue to benefit, as our birth rate and productivity grow, they open the door to new markets for additional goods and services to challenge the imagination. Marketing and advertising can and must rise to new heights as we come to grips with the opportunities that lie ahead. Our first and biggest opportunity is the expanding population. Markets are people with incomes and demands. In the past two years alone, our population has increased by five million, a new American every two minutes. According to reasonable estimates, we should reach 175 million by 1960. And as the 60s progress, the babies born in the 40s will be creating babies of their own, meaning a new surge in the birth rate. The promise for 1970 is a population of 195 million. Obviously, these figures are charged with meaning for those who process foods and manufacture drugs, footwear, and apparel. In fact, the increasing demand for goods and services is bound to reverberate throughout industry. Opportunity? Highway construction, 
As a nation, our life is slowly being choked by our antiquated highway system. The government has a $100 billion highway program, which offers a profusion of opportunity for anyone with a stake in America, from the lady who likes her eggs country fresh, to the men who make road building machinery, who can well look to a $250 million increase in sales a year. New highways mean steel of all kinds, and sales of steel can expect to increase by $344 million a year. Cement, concrete, asphalt, tar, road oils, an increase of $435 million a year. And just think of what will happen to the production, sales, and service of automobiles, truck and bus transportation, gasoline and oil and tires. These functions account for nearly 10 million jobs meaning 10 million wage earners and their families better able to buy products of all kinds in every locality of the U.S. Opportunity, rewiring the home. It's a fact that four out of every five American homes cannot accommodate the electrical wonders of today. Why? Because most homes are not adequately wired for modern appliances. Here's a giant size opportunity, an $8 billion order for raw materials producers of copper, steel, insulation, electrical appliance manufacturers and distributors, and the people who plan or work for them, public utilities, which must meet the resulting upsurge in demand for gas, oil, and electric power. Opportunity, urban redevelopment. Think of a business, any business, industrial or consumer, and then imagine the opportunities that would open for that business if our cities would step up their present redevelopment programs. Our cities need enlarged parking facilities, more bridges, redevelopment of slums. Add the crying need for new city schools, hospitals, and recreation centers, and urban redevelopment emerges as the biggest single task and opportunity ahead. Less tangible, but just as real, is the opportunity in new product development. The past is only an inkling of the future. And look at what jet planes, penicillin, nylon, television, have meant to our economy and our workforce. This much is certain. 10 years from now, a good part of our workforce will be making products as yet unknown, or now incubating in laboratories. A recent statement by a giant electrical company, referring especially to electronic and atomic energy, summed up the near future in these words. The fields are so promising that we expect to produce more in the next 10 years than in all of the previous 75 years of our existence. Opportunity, the suburbs. One-fifth of America, over 32 million people, now live in the suburbs and a million and a quarter more are moving in each year. This shifting tide of population carries with it a clamor for new shopping centers, new schools, new highways, new fulfillments for off hours and leisure time. As it builds, suburbia becomes a green pasture for every conceivable type of insurance line, and suburban living opens new opportunities for beverages of all kinds, sporting goods, the entire spectrum of consumer goods and services. Opportunity, education. The number of high school graduates has doubled since as recent a year as 1940. This in itself means opportunity to the business community. For it's a matter of straight statistics that the higher the education, the higher the demand for more goods, better food, more leisure, more travel, more education. A people with high standards of education is a people with high standards of living. Opportunity, leisure time. The average American today works 15% fewer hours than he did a generation ago. Yet his productivity is more than half again as high. Both trends, rising productivity and shorter hours, will continue. The increase in leisure time, now and in the years ahead, is a creative economic force bringing new needs, hence new opportunities for marketing. These are only a sampling of the great opportunities in store. Opportunities that could, 
and should and will be seized by American businessmen to create more goods, more jobs, more income, and more opportunities for us all. As we peer into the future, the signposts become visible, even legible. We know we are somewhere in the middle of a period of unprecedented economic change. As one industry spokesman recently wrote, for those of us who view history as a fascinating spectacle, the prospect of the coming quarter century is exhilarating. It is as if we were privileged not only to see, but to participate in centuries of development, telescoped into a brief span. It is not too early to train your sights on this prospect right now. <laughs>